RC from the Mom Top Joiner Shop here. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about cock baiting. Now, if you're an aspiring maker of fine furniture, and you were wondering what that was, and you Googled it, well, I hope you were alone when you did that, because you might have found yourself in a compromising position with whoever happened to be around at the time, whether that be your boss, your spouse, your kids, or your friends. So to spare you the potential embarrassment that that scenario presents, I'm going to talk about it in this video. So what is cock beating? Cock beating is a beating around the perimeter of a drawer front. And it's a centuries old term, so don't blame me. And it's a great way to add a little bit of class and some punctuation to a drawer design. Um, I'm obviously a fan, so I'm gonna be doing a little bit of this in today's video. And because I work mostly by hand, I'll be doing it that way. Although if I had the power tools, I would do it that way as well. Uh, so yeah, in this video, cock beating by hand. Stick around for some hot cock beating action. <laughs> so here I am at the bench and the drawer that I'm going to be applying the cock beating to the face of is sitting here. Uh, if you look at my last video about drawer slips, this is the drawer from that video. So if you're curious about how these drawer slips came to be, I uh, would check that out. You'll notice one thing about this drawer that is a little bit peculiar, and that's the layout of the dovetails. They are a little stubby. They don't go anywhere near the face of the drawer, and they're also pretty far from the corners. And the reason I laid them out that way is because I knew I was going to be cock beating this drawer, and I needed to leave room for the cock beating to fit into. Basically, what I'm going to be doing is creating a rabbit at the top and bottom of the drawer front, and then a narrow rabbit off the end of these tails to apply the cock beating to. But before I can do that, I need to make my cock beating. So what I'm gonna use for stock for that is this piece of walnut here. That's pretty straight grain, which isn't always the case with walnut, so I'm glad I have this handy. The thickness of this is quite a bit more than the thickness of this drawer front. I want my cock beating to be a little bit wider than this drawer front. So I think I might mill it down a little bit thinner before I get started here. But that's what I need to do first. I need to make my beading, and then I can mark out the thickness of the beading onto this drawer front and remove material where the cock beading is going to go. All right, so I got my stock ready to be made into beading. Now, this was a little bit bowed when I started, so I flattened it with my joiner plane, and then I ran it through the thickness planer until the thickness of my stock was just a little bit more than the thickness of my drawer front. And then I cleaned up the edge here. I uh, cleaned up the bandsaw marks that were on it and made sure it was square and then went over it with the um, smoothing plane because this walnut uh, had some rough spots on it with the low angle blade I was using in my joiner plane. So now I have this all ready to go. I'm gonna clamp it down to the edge of my bench such that it's just overhanging a little bit. And let's use some Hold fast for that. And now I have my Veritas plow plane with a beading blade in it. Maybe I can show you a beading blade. So a beading blade just looks like that. And with good straight grain stock, these are just a joy to use. These are great. And the blade that I have in there currently is the quarter inch blade. I actually have three of these drawers that I'm gonna be doing cock beading on. And because the drawers graduate in size, as do the recesses in the fronts of them, I thought I would graduate the size of my beading as well. So this one's gonna get a quarter inch bead. The next smaller drawer is going to get the 3 16 And then I have an even smaller drawer after that that's going to get uh, an eighth inch beading on it. So uh, when you use your plow plane to create your beading, you wanna set it up such that the inside edge of your bead just lines up with the outside of the fence. And I'm gonna to have to get a picture of that so you can see what I mean. So let me try that and then uh, we'll start doing the actual beading. All right, got my stock ready. It's overhanging from the edge of the bench right there. I got my plow plane all set up. I actually don't use the depth stop when I do this. I uh, cut the bead until there's no longer a flat on top of the bead from end to end, and then I know I'm done. So that's how I'm gonna be doing this. So I'm using a pretty light cut to start. This looks like I'm going with the grain, but it's one of those deals where you just don't know for sure until you make your cuts. So let's see what happens here. Doing all right so far. A little bit tear outy, but that's on the far side that I'm not gonna be keeping. So I'm just gonna keep on going 
until I have a nice round bead from end to end. And now you can see my bead has started to form. There's still a little bit of a flat on the top, but as this gets perfectly rounded over with no flat on it, I have to actually start to lift off of the cut as I get to spots that have already been completed. And then once I have very little flat, the full length of this, I'll just do one long pass to kind of smooth that whole bead out from end to end. This is where having good lighting is helpful. I have just next to the camera there, I have my uh, desk lamp pointed straight down the speed so I can look at its reflection and see where I still have a little bit of a flat on top of the beading. Right now I have some a, a little bit at the end there and some right here. So I'm gonna hit those problem areas, get real close, and a little bit at the very end like that. And then I'm gonna do a full length pass. And you can see that the, or here, that the plane was skipping a little bit as it went across. That means it didn't hit every area evenly. So I'm gonna use a really light cut and do another pass until I am in contact with the bead, the full length of the bead. There it was. That turned out nice and smooth. Pretty happy with that. We're golden. All right, so I'm gonna rip this free on the bandsaw and then come back and smooth the opposite side of it, of the bandsaw marks. Now, before I rip this on the bandsaw, I wanna show you something. So I'm gonna be cutting this out on the beading side of the board. Now, ordinarily, you know, if I knew that this board from end to end had parallel sides, that is the uh, consistent width from end to end, I would run it this way and you know, line the blade up with a bead and maybe put a feather board on it to hold it snug and that would be a really safe way to cut the beading. But I don't know if this board is an even width from the end to end and I don't want to have to fiddle with that. So I'm gonna be cutting it from this side and just making sure that I apply pressure into the fence as I move along. And you'll see how I have the blade lined up, hopefully, I have it zoomed in as far as I can, uh, so that it's just cutting into this edge here. So I'm staying a little bit away from the bead when I cut this, and I'll be able to plane that smooth after the fact. I don't want to be cutting into my beading, otherwise it's useless. So I'm gonna leave it like this, and just make sure that I apply good pressure against the fence as I'm making the cut. Hope that makes sense. So now this beading is ripped free. You can see there's just a little bit of what they call a fillet, I believe. I don't know, I'm not a period furniture maker, but um, yeah, there's just a little bit of a lip there and I got my bandsaw marks that I need to plane off. Uh, now this beading stock being a quarter inch thick, is thick enough that I can put it up against a planing stop and hand plane that without worrying about this kind of bending and buckling underneath me. However, when I plane it, I'm gonna be planing into my stop. And the last thing you wanna do with a plane blade is hit a metal planing stop with it. That'll make a mess of things. So the way I'm going to address that is to use a ruler. So I have just a cheap you know, hardware store ruler that's about an eighth of an inch thick. So it's not as thick as my planing stop. And that will allow me to elevate this beading such that it still catches the planing stop. But when I plane it, I'm not at risk of planing in to the planing stop with the blade of my bench plane. So that's how I'm gonna do that. Now, when I go to do the other drawers, uh, which won't be in this video, but um, those use a thinner stock. So if I get to the point where my beading is uh, too thin and flexible to use this technique on, what I'll be doing instead is using this little sled here. This is actually for my block plane. And my block plane fits right into this track like that, and it has a stop kind of glued to the end of it. And what I'll be doing is cutting each piece for each side of the drawer just a little bit over long, 
and then dropping it into this sled and then running the block plane over that to remove my bandsaw marks. And because those pieces are shorter, they won't buckle at that point. I'll be doing this in a little bit different order of operations when I get to the thinner stock I'll be using for the smaller drawers. So I just wanted to show you that real quick. So now I'm gonna plane this down and when I get closer to where this fillet disappears and I have a nice rounded over flat beading, I'm gonna hit the rest of it with my smoothing plane to remove any tear out that might be present still. So let's go ahead and do it. While I do this, I'm watching the profile in the end to make sure these sides look parallel to each other. And I really just need to eyeball that. Not really the case yet. Let's dial it back a little bit and use the smoothing plane. Now the smoothing plane has a higher angle blade in it. And as such, it's less likely to tear out this grain when it gets a little bit ornery. So it leaves a smoother surface in the end. And I'm just going to hit the problem areas until I remove those little fillets using a lighter and lighter cut as I get close to the bullseye here. I can actually feel if there's any fillet left with my finger right there. And I'm not quite to it. They're running pretty parallel, so doing all right. Looking good there, nice and round. Almost no fillet left to speak of. I'm liking that. Let's chop it up. All right, now I've cleaned off my bench. I put some stuff away and got some other stuff out and now I'm ready to mark out my drawer front now that I know what the thickness of my beading is going to be. So I'm gonna take that measurement using my wheel gauge and I'm gonna mark that out on my drawer front. So I'm going to mark the side of the drawer front, being careful not to get into where the drawer side is, where the, the maple is. I'm putting a knife line on the edge so I can see if I'm parallel to the edge. And of course, I'm going to do the front as well. And the other side of the drawer front. Just like that. And I'm going to rinse and repeat and do the bottom the exact same way. And I also want to mark the sides just like this as well. I'm just going to put just a little notch on the side. Because this is a quarter inch beading, I don't want to go any more than a quarter inch down the, uh, the front of the drawer there. Otherwise, well, I guess it doesn't matter because I'm removing that later anyways. So never mind. Oh, now I need to do the front. So this is set to the thickness of my beading. I need to also mark the front right here. Now as with any operation, whether you're using hand tools or power tools, if you're removing a cross grain section of the wood, then you should do that before you remove any long grain sections of the wood. Uh, so if you get any kind of blowout or tear out or splintering out of the fibers at the end of whatever cut you're making, you're gonna be removing that when you go to do the long grain sides. So the parts that I'm going to be removing first to install the beading are going to be these ends of the drawer front. All right, so now we need to set up to remove these ends. All right, now we're getting to the scary part where you start to cut into the drawer you so painstakingly hand cut dovetails and drawer slips for. I need to remove these ends. In preparation for doing that, I'm going to uh, actually cut out a little bit of a recess up to my knife line to give my saw a place to rest when I saw into this nice drawer front that I worked on. I'm going to get in here with a paring chisel and remove a little bit of wood right up to the knife line. If my marking gauge will go deep enough, I'll deepen the line and make that line even deeper. 
with the chisel. And it looks like I'll be able to in this case. We'll make this cut even more safe. Now my saw has some place to drop right into and it's less likely that I'm going to goof up and get out into the drawer face. Even if I do a little bit, I do have a plan B for that. In fact, I might even do the plan B anyways, which is to have my beading almost flush to the front. You can have your beading either project from the face of the drawer front or have it be flush with the beading kind of creating a little bit of a recess. And then what I do in that case is put a little bit of a chamfer around all these edges. So if this edge gets goofed up where I'm sawing here, I can put a chamfer there and then put my beading adjacent to that and it'll still look really good. But here we go. Let's do some sawing. Oh, hold on. I didn't put a mark there. What the? I want to be able to see if how vertical I am by eyeballing that knife line on the end there. All right. So I can drop my saw right into that deepened knife line that I created there. And I'll very carefully start sawing away the draw front. And you know, if you go over your line a little bit, it's gonna get removed later anyway, so. Nothing to get too concerned about. I got that cut, and now I'm gonna do it on the other side. So there I have both of my cuts at the ends of my drawer fronts, and I could remove this now if I wanted to, and it wouldn't be the worst idea, but what I think I'd prefer to do is remove the top and bottom because I have my knife lines there. A longer knife line is a little bit easier to see it that you're parallel to um, than the shorter ones. So I'm gonna remove these tops and bottoms next. I just wanted to show you my setup here for how I'm going to hold this drawer while I work on it. So I need to remove a rabbet on the top and the bottom of this drawer front. And to do that, I'm going to be using this tool here. This is the skew rabbit plane from Veritas. Any rabbit plane will do the job. And in order to use that rabbit plane, I need to immobilize this drawer, of course. So what I ended up doing is using some eight quarter cherry off cut that is found on the floor over here, smoothed off the end of it, pushed it against the hold fast and, and clamped that down. And that gives more support of the full height of the drawer side, kind of supports it. So I don't twist the drawer enough that it you know, potentially breaks the glue bonds and the dovetails here. And then at the back end, I have what's called a doze foot. And this is just you know a piece of wood with a 45 miter cut into it. And then I have that clamped to the bench with a hold fast. And I just drop my drawer in here like this. And that keeps it from moving back. So I have support in this direction and in this direction. And that's all you need to be able to cut a miter or really use any kind of joinery style hand plane. So that's my setup for immobilizing it. I'm set up to make this cut. I have to set up the tool, of course. And what I want to do is just remove drawer front. So I need to move the corner of my blade right up to this tiny little gap here and not beyond it because I don't want to blow out the drawer side right there. So this is fraught with peril, but I'm going to give it a shot. And I'm just kind of eyeballing in from an angle here to see how my blade lines up with that corner. And it looks like we're doing pretty good here. And now I'm going to tighten down real good because I don't want my fence to slip. Let me check this backside too and see how we're doing. If I actually leave a tiny bit of material right here, easy enough to remove after the fact. I just don't want to overshoot it. So let's see how we do here. Now, besides the fact I'm going against the grain, we're doing pretty good. And I'm just going to watch my knife line here and work my way down to that. And I can watch from the ends here and see if I'm parallel to the knife line on the ends. And I'm doing pretty good there as well, so keep on going. And you can see I'm left just a little bit of material there. Totally cool. I'd rather have that than blow out these edges. I am so close. I mean, right on that line, so still a little scary. Let's have a little more 
meat on this end than this end. So I'm gonna try to address that. There we go. There you have it. Getting there. I just need to do the other side. So you can see I have the top and bottom of my drawer removed here. It's starting to look a little bit naked. And now I need to remove these edges. And you may be wondering why I sawed the shoulders of these ends rather than just using something like the skew rabbit plane I was just using. Well, the reason for that is when you cut cross grain with a skew rabbit plane, you rely on this little knicker here to separate the fibers on the edge of your cut right there. Getting that knicker lined up with the blade is a royal, royal pain in the tuchus. So I do not use this knicker anymore. I've nixed the knicker. And what I much prefer to do is to saw my shoulders ahead of time if I'm going cross grain. And then I can use the skew rabbit plane to remove that material if I like. Well, I had a little bit of a mishap here. So while I was filming, I somehow hit the trigger on the camera and turned it off and turned off the recording. So uh, right before I was removing this material. So what I ended up doing was just coming there with a chisel, putting it towards the end of where it was sticking out here because this is all short grain and it's only being held on by this piece, this piece, and this piece. The ends of these pins. So when I gave it a tap, 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 that whole chunk just broke right loose right along the knife line. So that's the simple, easy way to do that. When, you're, when you have a short grain piece that's that small, it just pops right off like that. So now I have little bits of pin that are still kind of projecting right there. So what I'm gonna do is put this in my bench and clean up that edge. And you can kind of see the, I don't wanna over tighten this because I don't wanna like break the glue bonds of the uh, dovetails there, just, just enough to hold it. And then I'm just gonna pair this flush to the ends of these tails, just like that. And yes, I know I'm using a chisel against some glue. Oh, the horror. That's supposedly a big no-no, but this is high glue, and I find that it doesn't really dull a chisel the way like a PVA glue might if you were to encounter it with your chisel. So I'm not gonna worry about it. And you know what else? I know how to sharpen. So I'm not really worried about that right now. I just want a nice clean rabbit for the cock beating to sit in. All right, now I'm ready to start cutting some beading to fit the drawers. So I'm gonna do the top and bottom parts of the drawer face first. So to do that, I have to square up one end, which I've already done here. Line up with the edge there real good. Of course, your finger has a sensitivity to know when you're flush. And then I'm going to put a little tick mark with a marking knife on the other side. Probably can't see very well, but here we go. Here's my little knife line where I'm gonna cut it to length. So I'm gonna carry that knife line all the way around and cut on the outside of it so I don't risk kind of blowing out the fibers on the part that I'm going to be keeping. So get over here with the square. Since this is the part I'm gonna be keeping, I'm gonna cut on this side of the knife line right there. And I'm gonna to trim to fit. So I'm actually gonna cut off of the line just a little bit to be on the safe side. Need to take a little smidgen off of there. I'll start by doing that on the shooting board to kind of get started. But when I get close to my line, I'm gonna use my secret weapon. So I'll show you that in just a moment. So I'm not sure how clear that is on the camera, but I uh, use my shooting board to get right down close to the knife line, but not actually touching it because if I go one pass too far, I'm gonna blow out that back corner and that will show on the side of my drawer once it's installed and I don't want that. so. I also want it, the end grain to be smoother than my uh, shooting board plane would leave it. So what I use instead is this contraption right here. This is the Veritas shooting sander. And this has a base that's basically the same width as your typical shooting board plane, except instead of a blade on the side of it, it has adhesive-backed sandpaper. And this sandpaper is about 180 grit, if I recall correctly. And when I use this, I don't have to worry about the uh, blade that would blow out the fibers in the back side of the cut. Not only can I trim it to that final knife line, but I won't have any fibers separating. So I'll just press it in against there. And this is my old shooting board. So I kept it around just for this purpose. Get a little close there. This 
This uh, sandpaper is getting a little bit worn out, actually. I've been too lazy to replace it. But yeah, I mean, that is a butter smooth surface right there. And I am sneaking up on that line. That's pretty nice. Now, we'll see how it fits in here. See if it's as flush as I want it to be. That's pretty good. But I am noticing that there is a little bit of a gap here and here. I mean, it's pretty tiny. But I might be able to get that a little bit tighter if I take one pass with the shooting board plane on the back side of this. I'm guessing that and it kind of looks that way. That it's not quite square on the back side of this. And this needs to be a smoother surface anyway. So I'm going to do one pass over there on the shooting board plane and I think this will be ready to go. Then I'll have to do the bottom side as well. And then I have to notch out these corners right here at a miter to accept the parts are gonna fit on the ends. So that's gonna be a little tricky when I get to that point. But first I have to make another one of these to go on the bottom. All right, I made the beading for the bottom and I marked it with a B. So that's gonna go on the bottom part of the drawer front. And I have another one with a T on it that's gonna go on the top. And now I have a nice little sandwich going here. What I need to do now is mark where I'm going to cut out the miters here because I'm not gonna miter the full width of this. I'm only gonna miter the part where, of course, the side beading is going to meet up with that. And in order to do that accurately, the best way I know of to do it is to put a piece on, make sure it feels flush, and then put a clamp on that. And I have one of these little one-handed clamp dealies. It's nice and tiny. Make sure it stays put. It's feeling pretty good. And now I can mark these little shoulders out on these corners here. So I'm gonna get in here with a marking knife Put a little mark right there. And I'm gonna put another one right here. It's kind of hard to show the camera and do it at the same time, but doing my best. I need to do the same thing on the other shoulder, of course. And I can't push very, very hard, so I'm gonna to have to make a lot of consecutive passes. So this corner and this corner need to be mitered away to this corner here. Next thing I'm gonna do is carry that knife line, which you can barely see even if you're you know, not looking through a camera. But I put this wheel gauge right to that line and I'm gonna mark the end grain right to the corner there. And we need to do the same thing on the other side. It should be pretty much the same spot if it isn't. This is a micro adjustable gauge. I should be able to sneak up on that. There it is, all right. So let's get this end grain as well. Now that I can see that pretty well, I can start to cut the miter. All right, well, my camera cut out again. I think it's overheating or something, so hopefully I can get through this. So I flipped this around and I'm doing the miter on the other side now. I gotta trace that knife line so I can see it better, like so. Right there. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pair away this miter freehand. And as scary as that sounds, it's actually not that bad. If you just take your time, leave a little material at the back side where my knife line goes over the top. And just pare away a little bit at a time. And check your progress as you go along. Make sure that you're cutting your miter somewhat evenly. Of course, it's those last few passes that are the ones that really count. And what I'm trying to do here is make sure that my miter connects that knife line and this corner right here. And I can watch this distance, this flat, and the distance between the knife line and where my miter ends to see that they're the same. And that's how I'll know that I have my miter angle just about right. Just step back and look once in a while, see how I'm doing. It's good to leave a little bit of material right in the back there. So if you uh, get a little carried away and push too hard, you'll just kind of bump into the waste that's at the back there instead of potentially damaging the part that you intend to keep. This is one of those go slow to go fast kind of moments. And 
Really the important part is the second miter you cut leading up to the first. So even if this is just a little bit wonky, you'll have a shot at redemption. And I'm just kissing a knife line there. I'm almost to the corner at the top there, just, just a tiny bit of a flat. So I'm going to try to focus my efforts on that corner there. There we go. And then I'll remove anything that's in the middle here. Now I'll just clean this out. Well, I gotta clean up this back face a little bit. The camera's in the way, but you get the idea. So there is my miter cut. Just clean up the inside shoulder there. Got the other side done. And rinse and repeat on the piece of cut beading that's gonna go on the top side of the drawer. This is the bottom piece here. All right, I finished pairing those miters. I cleaned them up a little bit and I stuck them where they're going to go and clamp them. I haven't glued this yet because I'm actually gonna be ebonizing these walnut parts, but you can see how they meet up flush to the ends. And look at those dovetails now. Now they look proportional. So that's a, a consequence of some good planning there as far as the dovetail layout's concerned. You can see that my pins are almost of even thickness. You can see how the cock beading meets up to the shoulders of those dovetails. And so now all I have to do is cut the little short pieces that fit in between these miters. So I'm gonna cut out a piece that's basically the full height of the drawer front and then slice it down on my shooting board until it's nice and skinny and the beads match up to each other that way and then try to miter them until they fit into place. And this is a case where it's good to have extra material to cut your beads from. In case you goof one of these up, you can always redo a small part. They're small enough that you can do them pretty, pretty quickly. So you do have multiple chances to get this right. started here and I cut it just a little bit over long and then I trimmed the side down until it was just a little bit over wide and then I'm going to get one of these miters going. So the way I'm going to do that is to use this old bench hook as a stop against which to pair and I'll get my miter started with a crank neck pairing chisel here because I'm going to be holding it with one hand and kind of pairing with the other. When I get close to when that miter is coming to a point here then I'm going to take it over to the shooting sander and kind of finagle it from there. So let's give this a shot. So that's almost to a point right there. So I'm gonna take it to the shooting sander and see if I can't get the angle right there. All right, so there's a little miter that I just paired with a paring chisel, and I'm sure that's not in any way even or close to the angle it needs to be, but it occurred to me that if all of my beading is of the same thickness, then when they come together at a right angle, then the angle that matches them together should be a, a 45. And I can see I need to remove a little bit at the heel here. I set up my shooting board sander so that it's at a 45 degree angle, and now I can work that miter with the sanding shooter until it is the angle that I need it to be. And I don't have to worry about the blade of his shooting plane knocking that corner kind of out of kilter. So I'm just gonna tuck it in there and have at it with the shooting sander until this little point here kind of disappears. <laughs> it's taken a while. <laughs> I really do need to replace the sandpaper with some that isn't totally worn out. So maybe before I do the rest of these, I'll uh, swap that sandpaper out for something a little more fresh. Yeah, it's like to a knife point right there. So I'll bring my drawer back over here and we'll see how it's fitting. Silly me, there's really no way to test the fit of this until I get the other miter going. So I'm gonna get that miter started. 
and then trim it to fit on the shooting cylinder. Once those miters all come together, then I'll just trim the back until the beading, the round over here, the half round, meets up at the corners, and then that'll be that piece ready to go. Let's see what we're looking at here. So as you can see, the miters line up pretty good, but I need to shorten that piece quite a bit before the inside of the beading will make flush to the gap there. So I'm going to need to take quite a bit off of this miter, and in order to do so, I think I'm going to take a pause here, replace the sandpaper on my shooting sander with some that will actually abrade a little bit better. Yeah, once I get that piece in place, you'll be able to see it, and then it'll just be a matter of rinsing and repeating for the other side. All right, so I'm back. So I took a heat gun and waved it at the shooting sander to uh, warm up the sandpaper and then I carefully peeled it back and it hardly left any residue behind at all on what little it did. I was able to just kind of rub off with my thumb and reapply a fresh piece of 180 grit sandpaper to this. By the way, they do make a version of the shooting sander that's longer in length that I very much like to get. I use this thing so much for small parts like this that I would really like to get a longer version of this, but this does do the job. And I've started to continue to trim this miter here, and then I just put it on the box and check it. I lined it up there. And what I'm gonna do is turn it this way to remove more at the point of the miter and hopefully get a little bit better fit out of this. And hopefully I can do it with just this adjustment to the shooting board fence. If I couldn't, what I would then do is shim one end of my workpiece with a little bit of a wedge or maybe a few pieces of paperboard or something like that to kind of get the angle just right. And that way I'm not totally freehanding the second miter to match the first. Um, I have a little bit more of a controlled environment in which to achieve that fit. So, okay, so I figured out my angle. What I ended up having to do is shim it a little bit. So I have a little piece of paperboard I cut out of a piece of cereal box and I'll just stick it in there and I can actually adjust the angle a little bit. I don't know if you can see that. That's one angle, slide it over. It's a little bit wider angle. And right about there is where I get a miter angle that really fits well with what's already on my box. So you can see it's quite easy to sand from that angle. So I'm well on my way now, I just need to keep finagling. All right, so I kept trimming that miter and trimming and checking and trimming and checking until I got it to fit just so. And what I need to do now is to trim this back side right here until it mates up with the beads on either side of it, and that piece will be done. And I just have to keep doing that to achieve the same thing on the other side. All right, so there it is in place. I've got it trimmed so that's flush all the way around those corners. You know, I've cut better miters, I'll cut worse miters, but again, with the fact that these pieces of cup beading are gonna get ebonized, uh, that can actually cover up for a lot. So not only do I really like the way the ebonizing looks, but it sure is practical too if you're doing this by hand and things aren't quite as perfect as you wish they were, it'll kind of disappear after a while. So uh, now I just need to do the other side and get these pieces ebonized. But since I just finished this piece and this piece is going in the left side of the face of the drawer, I'm going to mark this with a little L on the back of it. And whenever I use the left-right designation on parts, that's always from the perspective of the eventual viewer or user of the furniture. So when I'm facing the front of the piece, left is on that side, it's not from the back. And that's how I keep my left and right kind of straightened out so I don't get confused. So got one more piece to do and then we'll do some ebonizing. All right, so I unclamped my cock beaded parts that were dry fit and just brought them over here to this other bench where I can make a mess. And I'm all set up to do some ebonizing of these walnut parts. Now, if you're unfamiliar with what ebonizing is and why I would go through the effort to do it, I did a whole video on that in days gone by and I'm gonna put a link to that video in the description. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn these black and when they're ready to go, We'll glue them in place under the drawer and see how it looks. All right, so I'm ready to go now. I have my cock beating parts all ebonized. You know, they're still a little bit dull. They will really come into their own once I get some finish on them, but they're ready to be glued in place. Let's try to get that in place. So I have this little B here marking where that part goes. Now, one thing people don't realize a lot about liquid hide glue is you can actually do what they call a rub joint with this, just like you can with hot hide glue. Applying pressure and sliding it back and forth until you start to feel it grip and kind of tack up. Now that went together so well, 
I really don't even feel like I need to clamp this. When you're doing stuff by hand, sometimes stuff turns out just a little bit wonky and it could really benefit from having some pressure applied to it via a clamp. But when you really kind of nail the fit of something, all your parts made up really well with each other, you can just get away with just doing what we call a rub joint. There's plenty of long grain to long grain surface area there that will create a really strong glue joint if you use this technique. So this cock beating is not going to be encountering a lot of stress. There's not, it doesn't have to be, you know, it's not load bearing or any of that. So I guess since I have clamps sitting here, I may as well use them. What I run the risk of is when I tighten these clamps, sometimes it moves your parts. I might actually want to use my little glue applicator. This one's from Rockler and um, you can just spread glue with it. Eventually that glue will dry on here and it just flakes right off so you can reuse it over and over again. And it's worthwhile to have around, I think. All right, we're all glued into place here. So I'm just gonna let the glue set, take the clamps off and uh, you can take a look at the finished product. All right, so I got the clamps off and this is basically all done. All that remains now is to apply some finish to the drawer. Um, I did do a little bit of burnishing of these edges here. So this is uh, got a little bit of a chamfer that I put on it with a block plane just to re uh, relieve that sharp edge. And in order to do the same thing here, I can't do that with a blade like a, uh, you know, a block plane or something. So what I do instead is use a burnisher. You could use like the shaft of a screwdriver or something like that, but you basically just rub it on there and that will kind of dull that sharp edge that you have there without removing the ebonizing. So that's what I did on those corners. So you can see how the top and bottom pieces meet up to where the dovetails are here and that the end pieces are off the ends of the dovetails. That's the way you would traditionally do this kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so let's call that a wrap. So that's it. That's how you do a cockpit drawer. That's at least one way of doing a cockpit drawer. I'm sure there are many others. But with the tooling that I have and the way my brain works, this works for me. And I hope you'll agree that it's a nice look, uh, especially with the contrasting ebonized beading like this. It's kind of like a little tuxedo for your drawer. But I do have a confession to make. I don't feel like this turned out as well as it could have. I've certainly done better cockpitted drawers myself, and I can make any number of excuses for that. Uh, it could be that I'm doing it by hand, although you could just as easily mess this up doing it by machine. It could be that I'm doing it in front of a camera, so maybe I'm nervy. Maybe the camera's just in the way some of the time, which is certainly true. But it's times like these that I have to remind myself that regardless of whatever excuse I can concoct up in my mind, that my standards are quite a bit higher than the standards of the people that will be viewing my furniture in the future. It's certainly higher than the standards of a camera on social media. You can make a lot of stuff look good on social media that if you see it in person, you're like, oh, this person's human. And yes, I am human. So will somebody in the future encounter this drawer and notice that the miters are not completely airtight? Uh, I doubt it. I doubt they'll give a rat's anus. Honestly, so I just have to remind myself of that and keep soldiering on. I don't want to let uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. I think in the long run, when this is all said and done, and it's part of the overall project, that it won't bother me as much as it does right now at this moment. So um, I think I can live with it. So. I hope you got something out of this video. If you're curious to see uh, other things that I've done here, like the uh, drawer slips on the bottom here, or if you're curious to see uh, what this drawer ends up like when it's all done and I have a copper filled recess with a drawer pull on it and it's got finish on it, be sure to check me out on other areas. Uh, so of course the rest of my YouTube channel has all kinds of content that you can check out. And if you wanna see what this looks like, and a lot of behind the scenes, kind of how the sausage gets made kind of stuff. Uh, be sure to check me out on, on Instagram as well. And it's the same handle, it's just Mountain Top Shop. That's it for today. We'll see you next time. Now, if you like what you saw here, please hit like and subscribe, it helps me out a lot. Also hit the little bell icon if you want to be notified anytime I release a new video. And if you didn't like what you saw here, keep it to yourself, pal. Or watch one of my other videos. You might like one of those. Thank you for watching.